to conform to a timetable. I know your automobile offers you freedom and flexibility uh, that you don't necessarily have when you um, have to adopt and conform around a timetable. At any point during the day, I could leave this meeting right now and go get in my car and drive back home. Um, I don't have to like storm out of a meeting and wait at a train station for 30 minutes for the next train. Um, so we found that uh, people that generally had a kind of a fear or a dislike essentially of scheduling. Now the other big fear that we found um, through some of our research was essentially a lack of personal space, kind of a fear of crowding. Um, so people have, um, if you think about your automobile, you have this nice personal space for just you and a few other people. Uh, it can be totally conformed to you. You can have your fuzzy dice on the rearview mirror. You don't have to worry about anybody crowding up in your personal space. You know that both you and your belongings are safe. Uh, in mass transit, your own potentially could be very crowded spaces. You're constantly having to guard yourself and your belongings against others. So that lack of personal space, or that kind of invasion of your personal space was also another reason that uh, people were telling us that they didn't really, outside the Northeastern US, didn't really care to adopt mass transit on a daily basis. And then of course there's also the perception that this mass transit is dirty. Um, and this is both very figuratively and literally, people felt like mass transit just maybe wasn't quite as clean. So this all kind of makes this kind of very American idea of our automobiles where people feel like this is my comfortable safe space and this is kind of uh, the mode of transit that I would prefer even if I'm going to go sit on 35 for 30 minutes and not move at all, I'm at least sitting there with seven cup holders on my satellite radio. <laughs> so there's a lot of different, there's a wide spectrum of users of mass transit and uh, one thing is that we, we find is that uh, effective systems are effective systems, and the benefits, including a lack of schedule, do scale up and down that, that band of users, meaning that everyone is concerned about being late for their work. Some people are penalized even more than others when they're late for work because we can't all bag out of uh, being 30 minutes late to a white collar job. So it's pretty interesting you start thinking about these experiential things. The other thing I'd like to mention is we really believe in the benefits of mass transit. Uh, I want to make that really clear from the start. We, we know that circulators uh, extend the reach of retailers to find more customers past just the geographic area, and it also allows employers to have more leisure options. It, it, effective mass transit helps to solve a lot, a lot of interesting, or even move and offer new solutions. So, and this system we're about to show you uh, uh, aligns very well as an additive to other systems as well. Um, so. Michael told you about how people have this, uh, uh, generally this perception of fear of scheduling and a need for personal space, all right? So here's where I introduce you to, in the area of mass transit, there is an, a, a, an industry that competes on the basis of how many people they can carry per hour without a schedule, and that industry is the ski industry. That is their sole form of competition. Uh, it's not accurate of schedule. It's how many people can we move per hour with that. Now they have other points of competition that'll be interesting that we'll show you as well. Another one they, caught, they, they, they uh, compete on is how fast can we erect a system? Because if you're a ski area looking to choose a system, you have three months during the summer to put one up and you're gonna use the provider that one, can move the most people up your hill and two, can get it set up during the summer because you made a pretty big investment on, on new infrastructure. Now, to give you an idea of what capacities can be, I'm gonna start with hyperbole. I'm gonna, this is Zillow Tall Ski Area that I'm showing you here. They have a system of 174 lifts and gondolas that move 298,000 people up a hill per hour. They hold the record for lift capacity, all right? That meaning if you were run it 24 hours a day, which they don't, but that would be seven million users. That's only uphill if you carried them downhill and they weren't skiing, that would be 14 million users a day. Now these are theoretical maxes, but let me put them into perspective. What I'm really trying to establish here is capacity. The New York City subway only has to move 5.3 million people on a weekday. So uh, when we learned about this kind of capacity, it didn't mean that we thought chairlifts were a good idea for cities. There'd be a, <laughs> a lot of dropped cell phones and other issues. <laughs> But what it did tell us is if you were looking to move a lot of people without a schedule, the ski industry might be an interesting place to look. And there's an innovation there that's very interesting that's called the high-speed detachable gondola. It's not a chairlift. It's actually an enclosed car that goes on cables. And Michael is gonna tell you a little more about uh, the cars and the operation of a system itself. Sorry, we're not used to swapping 
podiums like this. Um, yeah, so the high-speed detachable gondolas is essentially a technology um, uh, bar that we were borrowing from the ski industry. Uh, and these are uh, uh, detachable cars that are uh, fixed to a cable, supported by towers. They have a cruise speed of about 12 to 15 miles an hour. Um, but to kind of clarify what these are, um, besides not being a boat, um, is the types of cable technologies. So a lot of people, when we have been talking about cable powered transit, start pointing out the Portland tram or the Roosevelt Island tram in New York. We're not talking about that type of technology. That is a completely different one called tramways. And essentially those are giant fixed buses on cables that can only go forward and then back up. What we're actually talking about is the one on, uh, that you see here on the screen on the right side. Uh, this is the high-speed detachable gondolas. Uh, this is an MDT system. They also have a different variant of this, um, which could actually be applicable here as well, called a 3S. And essentially, the difference being this is on a single cable that you see in this picture. Uh, the 3S system actually uses three cables, so two for support and one for propulsion. So that means two cables don't move, one cable does move. Um, but essentially, they're all high-speed detachable uh, gondolas, um, and you can customize these uh, according uh, to fits and needs. Uh, you can do anything from uh, accessories for bike racks on the outside, uh, but what we're talking about as far as size-wise is essentially four to eight-person gondolas, because at that size, we're actually uh, mirroring the automotive uh, kind of culture we have here, where uh, you're not getting beyond that kind of uncomfortable area where we're essentially, you're crowding in with a bunch of other folks. This also gives you the ability to pick and choose vehicles as they come through a station. So there's not really any guilt about you taking an entire car for yourself because there's another vehicle coming through just a few seconds behind you. Um, and of course, at this size too, it also has capacity on the interior. So instead of just doing bike racks on the outside, you uh, also have enough room to roll a bike inside. So essentially you can roll on with a bike um, or two bikes if you're on a larger gondola. Now what this means as far as um, when we talk about detachable part of it, which is kind of a, a tricky part for uh, a lot of people to kind of wrap their head around, so we'll spend a little bit of time here. Um, the detachable part essentially means as the car comes through the station, it's attached to the cable. As it enters the station, it actually releases from the cable and runs on guide rails. So it's essentially a motorized track that it gets onto. Now this decelerates the car down to just about walking speed, but it never actually stops. It keeps moving through a little less than two miles an hour. Um, now what this does is this means we don't have schedules because you don't have to stop the entire line and wait for people to get on or off like you do with uh, trains or, uh, or buses. Uh, it's continuously moving. Um, as it glides through the station, uh, as you can see in this photograph, um, it's actually level. So it's actually ADA compliant flat surface that you can walk or roll right onto these cars with. Um, and as I mentioned already, if, if a you know, a car glides through the station and there's a creepy looking guy like one of us on it, um, you can just wait two seconds and catch the next car that comes right behind it. Um, <laughs> because they're moving through at constant intervals. So it's essentially um, more or less like a moving sidewalk. Now as these things go to leave a station, uh, that motorized rail system that it's going through the station on actually accelerates the cars back up to line speed where they reattach to the cables. And when they, the gripping, the detaching and attaching to the cables is simply gravity. So as, as it leaves the station, when the weight of the car itself comes off that track, gravity forces this thing closed on it. So there's no way that it can come off unless it actually hits a support that lifts it back off that cable. It's very clever engineering. Yeah, it's, sure. It doesn't require extra power to grip the cable. Yeah, so that's a, like a complete thing driven just they by gravity. built other safety systems about that. That same mechanical device that uh, pulls the car down also engages uh, locks on the door so that they can't come open uh, during uh, access. Although we'll discuss some of that later, there are, are plentiful emergency procedures for getting those doors open if needs be. But it becomes an elegant system. It comes into the station, its weight comes onto the track, so it detaches from the drive cable, it decelerates in smooth fashion, it slows down, it goes continuously, a line of these will go continuously into the station. So if you can imagine them coming in quick, slowing down, every two seconds a new car comes in. There's parallel loading where people can approach multiple cars at once, load them in turn, uh, often with the help of a, a, a attendant at these stations for those not familiar with it. Gets back on the seat, takes off. So the continue, I want to plant that continuous nature in your mind for those who haven't been to a ski area before. It's a very powerful force, the psychology of continuous operation. It means the line for this thing, if there was a line, never stops moving. And it's one of the places they get those amazing capacities we talked about, which in urban operation, 
the sweet spot for peak operating efficiency tends to be 3,000 people per hour, and that's from point to point. Well, I'll tell you now that there's a big discussion in the industry on how to talk about that, um, uh, because that's, they, a lot of them will say that's not actually what's happening. You have 3,000 people an hour going this way, but you also have 3,000 people an hour coming this way. So they call that 6,000 people an hour. When you talk to uh, or follow up with other manufacturers, you'll find that that's a question to ask which side of this discussion are you on? Are you saying 10,000 people an hour because it's 5,000 each way? Are you saying, uh, you know, to, but most people operating in an urban setting found peak operating efficiency around 3,000 people an hour. Uh, that is actually, for mass transit, a very respectable number. It's a huge number. If you can work out the math in your head, how many buses you would have to run from point to point to get those kind of numbers. Uh, some of the other advantages that with this type of technology where we have a detachable car uh, really come down to um, just general operation. Uh, so some of the advantages being since these things can actually detach from the cable, you can actually literally have an inventory of, of cars that are sitting aside. This is also allows us to, um, to match uh, peak demand. So during rush hour, you simply add more cars into circulation and literally pull them out when you're not to save energy. Um, some of the other advantages of having these things detachable are kind of obvious, is such as maintenance and cleaning. You can easily cycle individual cabs offline. Uh, for maintenance or cleaning purposes. Um, and the other kind of big advantage, um, just when you're thinking about this thing logistically over a large system, uh, is the ability, since they do detach and drop onto these motorized rails, it allows you to do uh, some more flexibility in routing that you normally wouldn't have uh, if you looked at something like the Portland or Roosevelt Island trails where they're fixed. Uh, and this means we can actually have turning stations. So as these things glide through stations, we can actually make them take a 90 degree turn or even sharper if we needed to when they exit the station and kind of use each station as kind of redirects. This is one of the common questions about urban cable is does it have to run straight line and what is offering you is this, that, that no, you can make the mechanics of such, such with a detachable system that in order to, to, to turn a sharper angle than five or seven degrees that are common with cable systems, detachable systems can actually release from the cable to make a sharper turn while the cable runs a, a, the right kind of engineering and then reattach and move. And this, this is how they can, they can build more circuitous routes with detachable technology than straight line deck technology. And this feature is actually what makes it uh, a very good solution uh, as far as in an, in an urban environment because you have to be able to turn the corner. Yeah, we'll cover um, that more in a second. Another advantage of being able to pull cars like you saw in that yard is if you need to clean a car, uh, um, we were in Austin, so we were thinking about a line that would run at 2 or 3 a.m. You could pull a single car off, clean it, add another car, and, and run the system. You can also pull them off one at a time for maintenance. So you're, you're talking about more possibilities for real-time maintenance to keep uh, the system into an uptime kind of condition. Uh, so that's another one of the attributes. And uh, last thing to talk about in terms of operation is um, you can run miles of one of these lines off the same energy of a bus engine. Often they are uh, electric motors powering these systems, meaning it could be tied into West Texas wind energy and run carbon zero. Uh, some systems at, at skiers themselves, they use diesel motors attached to generators to run them uh, or have diesel generators as backup. But they're, they're uh, systems in balance, uh, like an elevator. There's a counterweight in each car, so if one car is climbing, another car is coming down and, and keeping the system in balance. So all you're doing is adding that energy to bring it up to momentum and sustain momentum so it can be a very efficient system over. Jared, is, um, is that the typical height of a system? Is that typical? What you're seeing here is an actual urban cable system in place. The height is variable, and it's something we'll, we'll talk about in a second. Okay. They can run very high they can run inches from the ground. Um, uh, what you're seeing here was the, the height that was appropriate to this situation in order to clear all the existing infrastructure. So now suddenly you have three-dimensional routing, which gives you great power for matching a system or bringing a fish system into existing infrastructure. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thanks. And we'll go into a little bit more detail about some of the uh, opportunities and affordances we get with some of the 3D routing, and especially in the urban environments in just a moment. Um, but essentially all these um, advantages and uh, kind of features that we've talked about with this high-speed detachable technology uh, essentially gives us a, a new form of mass transit uh, that we're calling urban cable. Uh, 
And as you can see here in this image, and kind of what we've talked about so far is um, given uh, this kind of speed, the detachable technology, the ability to turn uh, curbs, and kind of fit and align a, a form of mass transit that's more aligned to American culture, that's more dependent and used to automobiles, uh, this seems to be a, a very good feature. It is a good transition here yep. to the next part. So um, what he concluded there, you urban cable. If you're not running these things up and down mountains, instead just stretch them out horizontally, change the engineering to match the urban setting, uh, perhaps longer stations because you want to pack more people on, or perhaps shorter stations that you never use at ski in areas because they have quite a bit of line. That's a new class that we call urban cable. And if you were going to Google, you would throw in urban cable and you would start getting some information around this particular set. It's very much an emerging uh, innovation based on a technology that is sound and proven uh, over the last 50 years of operation in, uh, in the, the ski industry. It's just now starting to find its feet in a new setting. Uh, and one of the reasons is, is one of the attributes we were talking about, 3D routing <laughs> and old infrastructure. All right, so uh, Round Rock and Austin don't have too much dissimilar history if you go back to the 1850s, right? Uh, there's a, you guys have an old city core here. Austin has an old city core. In fact, most cities of the south and the west uh, have this issue that you don't find in the northeast. And that's that they grew up during the transition to cars. So they have three histories. They have 50 years of scaling infrastructure for the horse and buggy. Uh, down here, the rail came in at some point. And down in Austin, you actually had the occasional cattle drive to contend with as well. Uh, then uh, you have 50 years where the car came in. And it was, came in in a first a very uh, productivity-oriented tool and then a romantic tool. And then you have another 50 years, the last 50 years we've been in, where it's become something of a very productive thing, but also something to contend with. Uh, um, but that's how the histories of our cities grow up. What it means is that when you get towards the core, that first 100 years of growth, you have very dense, very hardened, and established eminent domain. The streets were narrower, then they grew wider, the buildings are in place. And that is something you have to contend with. Like if you look at Austin, Austin in 1837, Mayor Waller put a really beautiful street in his vision in Congress Avenue. But not all the rest of the streets are like that. They look just like your beautiful downtown here. We're very narrow, hard and dense. Uh, 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 so if you're gonna bring in mass transit, this creates an issue. Uh, and the issue is where do you put it? And uh, often it means that you need to displace existing traffic on surface streets because that's the space you can't run it through buildings you're not going to tear down buildings that kind of eminent domain problem so uh, you put it on the streets and displace traffic and austin is talking about surface rail a lot right now it's a system that's very similar to buses but above the streets there is more eminent domain available right and urban cable one of its chief advantages is it can use it right that eminent domain is also above the sidewalks right so there's some streets where if you considered only the street itself, there's simply not enough space. It's not considered a route. Whereas urban cable, if you measure the space from building to building up higher, you may actually be able to find a route. So that's one very interesting attribute of this thing. It allows you to think, can I put this in where people want to go rather than where I have the room to put it and ask people to follow it? Uh, so that's a very interesting thing. There's other impacts of this. Um, the system itself, is constructed differently. When we're, when we're in these dense city cores and we're talking about a lot of systems, they have continuous, uninterrupted construction profiles, like surface rail. You've got to basically touch every inch of ground. You're incurring costs. You're incurring disruptions on every inch of ground. But the uh, tower and the cables and the cars, that's a modular system. So it builds up differently. All you got to do is find room for each tower base and the stops themselves. You can prepare that space first. It's a lot less disruptive. Once that's finished and your system is engineered, you just bring it in and you bolt it down. Okay, that's a lot more of a, uh, uh, elegant of a construction process. This can create a lot less disruption for businesses in existing parts of town. It also creates a lot less disruption on, on users, residents. The last thing it does is it impacts cost because you're not touching every square foot. You have less eminent domain to capture and, and, and purchase and to clear with permitting. Um, another attribute that it has is the third dimension. 
we showed that tower and stop location. We showed capturing eminent domain above streets. But also this cable has a capacity to go over things. Like in Austin, we have uh, Town Lake. I believe you guys have some waterways up here as well. You have one heck of a railway right over here. And then you have I-35. These are all things that urban cable can go over basically with no additional cost. Uh, there's no improving infrastructure for infrastructure straights. Straight. As long as you can get up and over it in the type of tower spans, and some of these tower spans, can, as you can see, can get quite wide, uh, then you are, uh, you're golden. Uh, so that can really also help reduce costs just on the fact that you're not spending uh, you know, 34 to 84 million just improving a bridge for the weight of a, of a train. Um, it also gives you ability to go over existing buildings where you can get permission to do that and uh, creates, you got more uh, options for routing. All right, so we are actually going to be brave enough to go into costs here a little bit. I'm going to be very explicit and, and transparent because we're at a very er early stage of research on this innovation. And I think this audience in particular is very familiar with how complex a costing can be. So let me tell you what we do know. We know construction costs in, big, in general, general hourlies, and these are fairly consistent across the board. Um, and that's light rail equipment and putting it into place uh, typically runs somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 million a mile. This is construction costs, not system costs. Uh, subways where you're burrowing tunnels, we don't consider them in cities this side, and with our limestone, we don't. Uh, urban cable, the equipment uh, runs anywhere from 12 to 24 million a mile. We've had manufacturers tell us that an urban system that's been engineered for our climate, meaning it has heating and AC, uh, for our use profile, so cars that are designed for urban uses that can accept bikes that have more luxuries than a ski area car, uh, a car can be put in for 12 million a mile. Uh, we then took that figure and looked at uh, our experience in here and the desire of, of uh, some uh, uh, to do extra engineering. Uh, be it to change the look of the towers or such. These are things that are commonplace in Austin. In, uh, uh, um, so we doubled that cost, so $24 million a mile to go from a system with climate control cars and stuff to a luxury system, as we're calling it, just in case the manufacturer left a little out. We also know that there's a certain amount of hearing and uh, uh, regulatory compliance for our area that uh, we feel they may not have anticipated. Maybe they have. So 12 to 24 million in construction costs, uh, already considerably less uh, than the construction cost. Now system costs, we know the proposed light rail cost, it's out there in the news. We took the public figure, $550 million uh, for the first phase of urban rail in Austin. It's projected to be about 5.5 miles. That is a system that's going right through the heart of town, so it incurs pretty much all those costs we talk about in terms of routing and constructing new bridges or repairing old bridges. Um, so what we did here is if we looked at the 12 million and then we doubled it to 24 million, we actually took the land procurement costs, the stop preparation costs, uh, kind of like the permitting and public hearing costs uh, in a kind of a budget jujitsu straight from the urban rail plan and applied it to our system. So we estimated a $12 million per stop uh, acquisition and preparation fee and we put a, a certain number of fees in terms of, all right, so that's how we fudged it. So, so you know, pure transparency. What does that all work out to? It works out to about half cost. It means we could build 14 miles uh, and all the stops to go with it in our plan for the same $550 million. I consider those conservative numbers. We know uh, that the willingness to make all the Faustian bargains can drive costs down and up from there in these systems. We're, we're not there. We know that there are uh, some cities, small cities, that have put them in, in ski areas like Telluride or Breckenridge that have put them in for a fraction of a cost, three to seven million miles, dollars a mile. We know private people have put them in at those costs. We think with cities this is an intelligent way to look at it, though we have a lot more concerns in the urban environment. But still, just the attributes of being able to find better rights, which avoids eminent domain fights, the attributes of not building infrastructure for infrastructure, and the construction modularity we think are main cost advantages. So I'll leave that there, uh, and if you guys ha have have any questions in the in the Q and A? We'll address more how we came up with these numbers, but hopefully that's transparent enough for you to to make a good judgment of it. Um, but then there's the attributes of the system itself that we think are fairly strong. Uh, 
in, in terms of making this an additive system to other systems. And Michael's going to talk about that and other attributes. Let's see, once you get him going, you just kind of let him go because <laughs> he does a good job with that. Um, so what would this system essentially kind of look like? So at Frog, we've kind of looked at um, from our research and everything based on what we know from Urban Cable so far. And it started applying that as a kind of a mass transit vision for Austin specifically. So again, I apologize that you're about to see the Frost Bank building again. Um, but essentially we were looking at like, what would this system actually look like? So we actually started um, branding it and um, treating it as a real thing. Uh, and we called uh, essentially this mass transit system the wire. Uh, which is kind of a funny sounding name, but uh, Austin's weird, so we thought it would kind of work. Um, we haven't come up with a round rock name, but if you gave us some time, <laughs> after this, uh, you know, perhaps at one of the local restaurants, I give you it's about an hour, we'll come up with a good one. <laughs> I believe it. So essentially, the wire is our vision for uh, a user centered, practical mass transit city uh, system for cities like Austin or Round Rock, the similar size uh, with the smaller tax base that obviously wouldn't be looking at um, such expensive options as Subway. Um, but kind of first things first, where would this thing go? Now again, what we've been looking at has mainly been focused on Austin and looking a lot at um, all the existing work that has already been done uh, on mass transit in the region. So we know that there's a, a high-speed regional rail that's on long-term vision. Uh, the existing metro rail line, which uh, the red line, which actually as close as it comes around Rock is Howard Lane. Um, and then the proposed urban light rail um, actually in Austin as a circulator. Now given urban cable speed and its continuous operation, uh, it actually does, to be perfectly clear, it functions best as a circulator not as a, as a commuter line to actually start interconnecting uh, far-flung cities. Uh, rail is faster for that. Uh, but given its speed and how it can uh, essentially move a mass very quickly, uh, it works really well in dense city core. So as far as like circulation goes within a city. Um, which means in Austin, uh, the wire could essentially cover the exact same routes as the proposed urban light rail for us. Um, and that's even if it crosses the river five times, it doesn't really matter to us. As Jared mentioned earlier, it's no additional infrastructure cost. So <laughs> what the wire could do, or urban cable can do, essentially, is uh, give us new opportunities in routing. It can take routing, and we can do something more with routing and turn routes into experiences. Now this becomes really valuable and when we start talking about uh, American culture and adoption of people to systems like this, and then also just from pure just tourist uh, perspectives. While we're on this map, I want to point out uh, two things. It's less beholden to ava available land. That's an interesting point for routing. Secondly, there is one, uh, there is one sa exception to the circulator rule, and that's when you have point to point of a, of a lot of traffic that you, you want to connect. For instance, if there was an area you wanted to put a business complex or to expand like a university or a college, but there was no availability of parking, this thing can make a very good point to point in where you move people on the parking to a mile away and then you're able to transit them in. Uh, circulators do that as well, but I also want to make that clear that there's opportunities like that. Some of those opportunities might be more uh, applicable uh, to the region up here, up north, uh, uh, but also um, the, another thing, if you look at this map, that may, may have lost over on, on, the, on the earlier slide. If you're bringing a train in for trailer, a lot of people now are thinking, I need to bring that train all the way in to a certain area of the city. A system like this means that you could consider bringing it to the last pasture land, right? Uh, 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 and that's your accumulator bringing people in, and if they know that there's a circulator on the other side, then they're more likely to you, uh, have more freedom to use those options. So now to the experiences that are offered here, because it's another great uh, possibility for the, for the system. Right. Um, so this ability, this kind of 3D routing, this essentially means we have some uh, abilities here that we've kind of already started to touch on here with uh, cable, is that we can literally go, doesn't matter if we go over geographic barriers like green belts or uh, waterways, we can actually go under existing infrastructure over existing infrastructure, or there's even been systems put in in parts of Asia that actually go right through existing infrastructure. Now, this seems a little crazy, but it actually gives you new opportunities as far as public-private partnerships go. Um, and what Jared was talking about, kind of uh, more organic growth with routing as well. So you, it's not cost prohibitive, essentially, to put a spur out to connect a high-density pocket to another. Um, and then kind of on a very low-level tactical side, we're not having to build rail crossings. 
We're not having to put in additional infrastructure or disrupt the surface. We are essentially layering the city where we are actually adding another mode of transit and a layer that's unutilized currently in most urban environments. It's so, an additive nature, not a displacement. So right. you're adding capacity to, to streets that are at capacity. So we talked a little bit about experience and creating this new experience for people. So what would that experience actually be like? Um, so we'll picture that we're a little further south in Austin here. Um, but you actually fly into Austin and you catch the wire at the airport. Now, given uh, the kind of modular nature of these types of systems, the stop can be actually located on the roof of the connected parking deck at, at Austin's airport, so which means you can come right out of the airport and roll right on to a car with no weight, no schedule, no complexities. You simply roll you and yourself and all your luggage onto this car and glide out. And you don't have any guilt about hogging an entire car for all your carry-on luggage because there's another car coming through the station two seconds behind you. So you don't necessarily have to worry uh, about hogging a car to yourself. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, uh, to the point of elevation and some of this 3D routing, um, this is actually a system that's in place in Barcelona. This is an extension of their subway system there. Um, and you can see that these cars come literally just feet over the ground. So this ability, um, this technology was adapted from the ski lift industry. And since we can rapidly change elevations, since these things were made to climb extreme elevations in mountainous country, uh, we can actually use that in an urban environment to create these 3D routes. And what that actually means, and it gets kind of really exciting um, thinking about this from just kind of an urban planning and tourist perspective, is you can actually show off a city in its best possible features and its best possible foot forward as far as any new visitors to the city comes. So in Austin, imagine leaving the airport. You would glide out from the, um, the airport, but we just skim just feet over the ground. So you can essentially go uh, skim just along the green belts and waterways that we have here in, in central Texas and have just this really lush landscape and actually have people actually take that in. Now occasionally, we can break through the treetops and actually climb higher when we need to, but we can also provide stunning views and vistas from it. Now, this is just something you simply can't do from a subway or any other form of mass transit. And it actually puts a much better first impression for a city uh, than the, you know, sitting in a taxi cab looking at gridlock on 35. Um, now, along, along your route into Austin from the airport, uh, you would pass through other stations, but again, there's no waiting. Uh, you don't have to stop and let the car fill up and wait for people to get on or off. It simply keeps going. So a few seconds later, you're back up to speed and on your way. So in Austin, we've already timed out um, routes from the airport. It would be 19 minutes from the airport into downtown before you'd be gliding into a rooftop station on the convention center. That's a pretty good time. You guys have driven the airport during rush hour. You know, that's one of these interesting things. 12 to 15 miles an hour, uh, it, it seems not fast. Uh, but it is predictable. It's not going to stop for traffic and it's not going to stop for light. So one of the things we did is we timed a lot of people's commute using a, a by actually a, a one of those running apps. And uh, my commute from 6th and Congress to near airport 935, my average speed in a car when there is no traffic, like at 8 p.m. at night, is 20 miles per hour. Uh, and during traffic, it can fall well below 12, 15 miles an hour. Uh, there's some data that in the central core uh, uh, of a lot of cities, buses will run about 8 miles per hour. So uh, 12, 15 is actually pretty good when you can start considering all the average speeds that are going. We do know that uh, there's a half an hour sweet spot with these things. Uh, uh, people like being in the half an hour. Okay, we got some time consideration. Yeah. So I'll go through this next spot and then we're almost done. Right, amen. <laughs> I like to imagine parking, having dinner in, in that shopping closet with Ikea, and then gliding into the Dell Diamond myself. And I think that would be a really nice picture. You would see the field before you got to the field. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk quickly about the benefits of commuters, because he talked about this experience, which creates this thing that it's kind of a tourist attraction, actually. It gives you uh, an interesting place, and commuters would enjoy that experience. But the main thing you have to offer people that are using this for, for commuting transportation is, is real predictability. It's continuous operation, continuous boarding is why they can put those little signs in a ski area that tell you exactly how many minutes it is before you board. And you can know your trip time before you get on this thing very reliably. This means that you can use your time to, you know, adopt the East Coast uh, way of sh I'll share this cab with you or you can use your time to wait and ri ride alone. And that matches up more with the personalities we see in the city. Um, it's more predictability, it's less waiting, and it's more personal space, right? Also, there's room for people on their bikes. Here's uh, proof positive right here. There's a lot of ways to accomplish this. Uh, that means it doesn't just integrate with other forms of mass transit like we've talked about. You can in in uh, 
interface very well with the other ground level circulators, not just our feet, but our bikes, car to goes, bike shares, bike rentals. So in a long term plan, it very, can be multiply in no life. Uh, um, stations. Okay, there's a lot more opportunities with stations as well. You can have surface stops that are very similar to something like a train station or a bus station. The length is very similar to a train station actually, and the cars come in and leave. But because you can work higher, you can envision one of these as a different architectural statement. For instance, you could plant one of these on top of a parking garage. So it's its own stop and a park and ride in a vertical orientation. Uh, you can imagine these existing over top as stops over top of intersections. There's a space that's never going to be used for anything but suddenly can become a very productive space. You could imagine uh, multi-use statements like pocket parks at the top, integrated re each retail on the bottom. There's a possibility to build you know, community around commuting uh, and help integrate it with the culture. But also, there's possibilities here. We would hope for public-private partnerships around stops and stop costs, ways to share the load. You know, this interesting thing of, of uh, do you want to build up the retail, have a long-term lease, and we bring in the stop could possibly exist a lot more here than it does with other forms of transportation. And as Michael pointed out, it's, you can't envision actually integrating these with the lower floors of existing buildings uh, or reinforcing existing structures like, you know, the roof of the brand new Ikea uh, parking garage. <clears throat> okay, and then Michael's going to talk. Uh, we did see it. Here it comes. Right. Yeah, here comes our here comes our specific uh, round rock slide that we were able to slip in today before we got here. Um, but essentially, uh, all of this kind of leads up to um, uh, stations being a powerful representation of cities, and it's a great spot to drive adoption and just overall uh, ridership within any system. Um, so essentially, people take stations very personally. Uh, it makes a statement about this is where I live. So you can imagine if there were different stations. Uh, for uh, uh, representing different neighborhoods or uh, sections of the town or different stops. Uh, we've seen this in, uh, in other systems such as uh, New York where people actually really take hold of the line that they ride daily or the stops. Now if you can actually uh, use uh, really smart and good design with that and, and have a brand that uh, people associate with then essentially you start driving adoption because uh, you make it part of the culture. So with good design we think that in, uh, the wire would be more than just innovative mass transit. Uh, urban cable can essentially become an iconic representation for a city, uh, which makes it part of the culture. Now, once you have what we've seen in any city, um, once something becomes ingrained as part of the culture and people begin to really feel passionately and, and personally about it, um, and it becomes ingrained, uh, people will use it. All right, so we'll, we'll just, we're, almost, we're pretty much done yeah, here. I want to close by saying that uh, there are cities doing this. There's not very many in North America, most of them are ski areas. Uh, we took a lot of information and for inspiration from them. There's no one really done it on the scale as envisioned as a full circulator, although there are some very good point-to-point -point lines in, in, in South America that are worth studying. Uh, uh, they've been uh, very successful in integrating. Um, and we just we thought we'd end with this yeah. slide here yeah. <laughs> because we live here too <laughs> <laughs> and open the floor for questions thank you all all right jared and michael questions start i'll just throw one out first um you talked about heating and air a minute ago so i know some of the questions that, that i've heard come up are, are very practical questions like heating and air and then also uh, people with disabilities. So you want to, can you address those? Uh, yeah, so we've actually had um, some discussions with uh, two of the largest ropeway manufacturers about this specific thing because um, the, the biggest thing that we would have to contend with is just as far as a pure adaptation of this technology in an urban environment, especially for Central Texas where we have 60 days of triple digit temperatures in the summer is adding uh, climate control to these things because generally they're made for mountainous areas with relatively stable climates. Um, even in South America where it's um, necessarily hot climates like Medellin, Colombia um, and a few spots in Brazil and some other locations where they've actually implemented this as part of their urban mass transit systems, uh, you're talking about close to the equator so you don't have the temperature swings that we do here in Central Texas. Um, so this is kind of one of the, uh, the biggest hurdles there but as far as um, our discussions already, um, it's not insurmountable at all. It's actually a pretty low actually, challenges. There's several options there. 
Both right. manufacturers have told us they have engineering solutions for climate control mm -hmm. that should be applicable to our climate. Um, we, we actually need you to, uh, at that point, to engage in this discussion with them. They both are kind of uh, proprietary about what their actual solutions are. We're not at liberty to discuss them in this form, but what we can tell you is they both have told us they do now have solutions for air conditioning and heating for a climate like ours. That is a change from as much as five years ago. As much as five years ago, they had not uh, figured it out, and they were really only looking to put these uh, systems in the tropics. But now they feel like they have, have that beat, and when we, uh, the, when we we quoted that 12 to $13 million price. They talk about that. They have told us that that includes the kind of engineering needed for climate control. As far as ADA is concerned, the flat level loading platform and the size of the doors offers an excellent opportunity. Ski areas in North America do require ADA compliance. Therefore, these things all also enjoy ADA uh, compliance. In fact, most of them can do it with no change in operation at all. And meaning someone in a wheelchair, or even a power wheelchair, can just roll right onto these things, even at the speed that they work. Uh, uh, there are also, though, provisions if, any, if someone did need it, uh, a stopped loading, there are ways uh, to stop it. Also, these systems, and I'm not sure if this came across, typically they're envisioned to use uh, station attendants at the stations. It's just that kind of a system. Uh, now, they're not necessarily needing to be as, as skilled as a bus driver. Um, ski areas tend to do this with college kids. I think we all know that. But um, those station attendants are friendly people, knowledgeable in how to handle these uh, specialized loading situations. For the broad area of ADA, though, it as is operates just fine. Yeah, and, and not for this form, but we actually have um, had these discussions with the manufacturer as well, and we have some videos that we just didn't want to show here because of um, NDAs and whatnot uh, that go back to 1992, uh, showing people uh, with disabilities actually effortlessly boarding and, and getting on and off these things. Yes, sir. Uh, Michael or Jared, I understand the circulator idea. I, I, I see the benefit in that, but you say it's not that great for point to point. Um, it's like from uh, <coughs> Round Rock at I-35 down to Breaker Lane at I-35. Is that because of the speed? It's mainly because of the speed. and why, there's why can't you juice them up a little bit? <laughs> you can. It's just a maintenance cost then. But, um, what they found over the 70 year, kind of 50 to 70 year operation of cable systems is that your cables wear faster. You can run the, you can spin the cables faster, you just but wear they, out the cables they are, quicker. You can go quicker? And, and there are you systems. Can actually. So, yeah. um, there's consumables involved with the today's system. And actually, I believe two things. One, the industry needs to be pushed on this engineering. And I think if someone signed up for a big enough system, they're ready to take on the challenge. But what we're talking about here, the speeds we've talked about, 12 to 15 miles an hour, are peak operating efficiency. There are ski areas that run much faster than that, but they have eight hours of downtime every night to do the maintenance, to recover from that. And they also have three seasons to do a, a repair. And what it comes down to, there's certain consumables uh, think of rubber bushings and such that allow the climb, the climb that when you run past a certain speed, those consumables uh, wear, quicker. wear quicker. And then there's cable wear itself. So, uh, and there are also, uh, there's some thoughts about systems that could run fast. So it turns into that balance. You run faster at a higher cost or you run slower at a sweet spot. So we've quoted what the peak operating efficiency is for now. The rest of it is a philosophical uh, uh, study on the public. How long are they willing to uh, go with predictability? Meaning it's not impossible to run a system that goes from here all the way to downtown Austin. It's just it's, an hour. Yeah, it's just a little over an hour. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a general thought that even traffic the way it is now, uh, um, people wouldn't take on that much time in a car. Most of the people who have examined this say that uh, trip times of 30 minutes are kind of what people want to spend in one of these cars suspended in the air uh, for now. One thing that's interesting though is you could daisy chain things together, meaning that you could build a system to another transport often like the, one of those parking and parking or a shopping center to a shopping center and as people became more accustomed with that you could put another one right next to it and you may have them riding an hour in no time. But does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Thanks. You may have answered a couple of them, but I, I kind of wanted to go back to the manpower needs for one of my questions. You, you mentioned maybe somebody at each station. What about other manpower needs to, to run the system? If something locks up, you know, who's going to be there to make sure, you know, what? 
Yeah, it's essentially uh, it's a minimal staff. So it's it's less uh, overhead than you would have for other modes of transit because you're not requiring operators for each vehicle. So given that the system kind of runs, it's it's very similar. Um, well, that's not even a good example. I was about to say San Francisco's cable car system because they run the entire system in San Francisco off one wheelhouse. Um, but that's not a good example because each cable car actually has a driver that's literally grabbing the cable and releasing it. This doesn't even have that. It's done um, on its own mechanically. So you're talking about there's two personnel. Uh, operating personnel, so station attendants in place of bus drivers. And this thing lays out as a cousin to the subway, so there's actually fewer stations than bus stops. Mm -hmm. uh, that person, uh, it's an interesting uh, opportunity to have doormen for the city. Yeah. Like Ambassadors a very to the city. Person to help the system. Now there's a second thing you're talking about, and that's the maintenance of the thing. And there's two options there. There's in-house, and then what a lot of people do is sign up for a, a, a service contract with the manufacturer so that their specialized person will come in and do the regular maintenance. Then you've got the people that work the yard, you know, so to speak, the guys that pull off uh, uh, cars and st stock them to the night, clean them and put them back up. Uh, and this is an area that we, that even we need more study on. on uh, uh, we've been trying before this meeting to get through some of the cities and cut through the clutter of, of what to we're told operating and maintenance is on a regular basis, which we're told it's, you're going to find it similar to a bus line, uh, um, or if it's in practice is more or less. Okay. Uh, I can describe the type of personnel to you. Unfortunately, we don't have good good numbers yet on what that total cost is, but uh, I, you know. Yeah, everybody's pretty protective of their numbers, both on uh, civic side and manufacturer sides of their course at this stage. So. so what about the cost of actually running the system? So you've got it, you've got it up, you, you've said what, the, what it costs to, to build it and put it in place. What about, um, you know, daily Go costs there. of running it? Okay, so that we consider that like the power energy consumption cost to keep it moving, and those are have a very good profile because you can run uh, miles long on a, a, the same cost as a, basically a, a bus engine. So it's the same type bus. It's engines. all electric, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. These so are electric can you, motors. Has anybody tried solar to try to power? Solar, you know, yep. as far as what's the best grid option to put in there, I, I'm not sure, uh, but. Uh, we always imagine tapping into the wind energy for this thing because then it would be a zero em yeah. emissions thing. But yeah, uh, West Texas is West Texas is very plentiful on our wind power, so um, that's a natural resource we have here that's infinite. So. Yeah, that's and that's infrastructure we're building as well. Uh, solar would just be a separate study. How much would it yeah. cost? But uh, to put solar panels on each of these, store it up with batteries and release it. But yeah, as an electrical system. There are a lot of options from, you know, the diesel generator to tapping into the grid to tap, tapping into wind energy to tapping into solar. Those exist. It's a lot more difficult to do that with, with some other systems. All of, uh, uh, uh. And we could also do things like smart grids as well with it. So it's just the power, based on power needs, it's just swap sources as well. So there's lots of options here as far as powering it because the basic drivetrain is So simple. I can give you a characterization of the profile. I hope I've answered that. As far as the cost go, that's another one that needs more study okay. to go to the cities to actually run those things. One of the tests, though, I would give an audience like this in terms of should it be studied more, like it could, could it actually be cheaper, is that ski areas run these things. With their, that is one. Yeah, they'll, <laughs> they'll own five or six of these and run them, um, and cities have resources that are much more distributed, but some, a business enterprise of that size can afford to run these things. John? I have a, what about ongoing funding? Is this assumed that this would be um, a public infrastructure and it's free and then it's so the ongoing, the, main, the, the installation and the ongoing maintenance and on the energy consumption is, handled through public funding sources or are we talking about like a text tag type of thing? I think that's for individual cities to, 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 to figure decide. Out. One thing we do know is that with this kind of capacity you don't need fares to control supply so you actually do have an option of do you want to fare this thing, do you want to put it with a text tag. The loading is so quick that it would be one of those really great scannable technologies if you wanted to do that. Uh, um, but uh, from there I think individual cities would have to and decide. The hopeful hope here is that cost profiles come down, like the saving in costs over something like surface rail gives you a lot more options to decide how to fund it. Yeah. 
We've actually looked at uh, multiple options as far as just operating models, and it's really, like Jared said, it's, mm. it's up to individual municipalities on that because it's, it can be handled in a variety of different ways. I love the idea of public-private partnerships. An example of that using Austin would be imagine if you had a parking structure with a stop on top of it in the new Mueller subdivision, and you charge $5 a car to park there and then ride this thing for free in the downtown. That's a very interesting funding option that uh, could exist because of the ability to build these unique stops that uh, makes it more appealing. Yeah. But that's brainstorming. I think yeah. individual cities really need to look at their funding. I think one thing, though, since the costs are not astronomical, it gives you flexibility to actually consider it realistically. Without whereas when you, funds. yeah, without, even possibly without federal funds, although that's not my place to, to yeah. say that, um, it, it would be. But when you start talking about the level of expense that goes into bringing surface rail into existing infrastructure, uh, you have to ask a lot more funding questions. No, I now. totally agree. Um, the comment of an hour to get from downtown Round Rock to, the say, the convention center. Last Thursday night, I was planning to be at the Hilton at 5.30. I left Round Rock at 4.30. Oh, no. Out there at 6 <laughs> or 6.10, <laughs> you know. So I got to 51st Street in like 10, 12 minutes, and then it took me the from 51st in the downtown the whole rest of the time. And so, you know, mm, 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 you know so I'd spend an hour on it. You could have uh, been studying proposals for funding that entire time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and exactly. Yeah. And then uh, my other question is, uh, obviously there's going to be some – storm activity, if the wind velocity got to a certain yeah. uh, miles per hour, you're not operating it, right? What would that? So if you think about where these things, this technology comes from, it comes from ski resorts, which are, they're running in the foulest weather you can possibly imagine in blizzards. Um, the modern systems uh, can handle wind speeds of at least 50 miles an hour. So for us here in central Texas, that's a really big blue norther where you're essentially talking tropical storm speeds. So we know that the systems are very stable in that. And then the other thing to consider when you're talking about wind or weather, inclement weather here in central Texas, is uh, given that we're not running these things hundreds of feet in the air, across miles of it. Um, the biggest wind speed problems that uh, ski resorts see is when they're actually crossing mountain valleys and uh, hitting up higher elevations where they have much higher wind speeds. Here, since we're talking about literally skimming the ground in a lot of spots, um, mainly operating a lot of systems possibly about 15, 20 feet above ground, we're not going to be exposed to such high wind speeds as well anyway. If you caught the answer that the current systems operate safely and up to wind speeds of 50 miles per hour. Uh, given It is conceivable that you do need to uh, uh, prepare these things for extreme weather events. Uh, just as we have to stop our buses from going across low water crossings when we have extreme weather events, it just becomes a mat matter of mass transit. But they're within now a capability where you're not stopping them at 20 mile an hour winds anymore. Right. You can run them in much higher winds. And then right. when you get to the 3S system, which is the one we didn't cost out, they can run in even uh, higher, uh, winds. higher winds because they have the two support cables and the single drive cable. And but, then my last question is, what's the maximum distance to stretch a cable between poles? Uh, there's a place in Whistler uh, where that's the largest span in the world. It's two and a half miles. So essentially, it's just as how big of a tower do you want to put up as how right. far you can span. Okay. I mean, uh, cable engineering will come into it eventually, but yeah, two and yeah. a half miles is a span. Uh, so long spans are, are, are done are possible and, and done regularly. Okay. Thank you very much. But the tower's a lot bigger. Yeah. It's, yes, it's, with much bigger a towers in engineering, but they have engineered for it before. So you. Would uh, I was going to kind of remind what John just asked you. How, how long can you run a cable line with one drive? Uh, typically what we've seen is about seven miles. Oh. And that's, so you're looking at like a 14-mile loop. Now that's, it varies. It just depends. Um, but that's also to go back to the wind question as well. So if you're thinking that there's high winds, it doesn't shut down. If you had 30 miles of system put in place, you're not shutting down the entire system uh, because you're actually hopping in segments. And it, the cars are detachable, and they actually release from one cable and grab the next cable, and the rider never knows. It's the same line. Uh, but since it's modular and segmented like that, if there's high speed, it can only affect a certain segment. So you're not shutting down the entire system. We can just shut down a segment. What he's describing is when you want to go longer than, than a single cable and wheelhouse will go, 
the cars will come down onto one of those tracks and they're actually dropping on a new cable. So you daisy oh. chain these together to get distances oh. longer than seven miles or three and a half mile little strips. Uh, at those point, those are great points to turn direction as well. But that's how it's done. Uh, another way uh, to think about it too is the way subways do it, meaning that you can be running a line and since it's continuous, a user can get off one walk a, 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 some short distance and immediately get on another one and go. The transfer situation, because of the continuous o operation, is a lot prettier picture, because yeah. you're not having to match up schedules. Mm. And you're not having to walk through a labyrinth of tunnels, if you think about a subway. Often, if you look at a subway or rail platform, if I just want to change directions, and the platform I can see 20 feet away, I have to go upstairs, downstairs, around a corner, down a hallway, turn a corner, and go up another flight, just to get to that other platform. This, you could do it all with a flat level platform. If it's designed correctly, because we essentially take the track above you, meaning you can walk from here right over to there. You don't have to go up and over the track. Okay. I have two questions. Uh, number one, is there any, you know, y'all talked about some cities that have been looking at it, but are there any cities seriously looking at it and adopting it? Because, I mean, clearly the, the advantage of cost is, is clear. However, why aren't the, you know, why wouldn't cities like San Francisco, New York, where there's high, high density, you know, be looking at this, you know, really, really seriously? Uh, it's generally what we found is it's just a lack of education. Uh, most people, especially when you're talking about um, spending tax dollars, go back to what's safe and what's known. And uh, you can look in Houston, we can look at Dallas, we can look at other surrounding cities. They all have light rail. We should have light rail. And that's generally what we've found is it's just more of an educational thing. Uh, nobody has really taken the leap to do this yet. Now, Jared did mention there are cities. Uh, Medellin, Colombia has two lines in their metro system. Barcelona runs an extension off their subway system that's actually gone as it goes up to the uh, old Olympic Park there. Um, there's quite a few places in Germany and Asia actually that use it. And then uh, only in the states here, all we see uh, typically is. Um, Telluride and uh, Boulder both have replaced a bus line at the bottom. Breckenridge. Uh, Breckenridge, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so ski area cities have, like, Telluride's an interesting case study if you look into it. They had like a seven bus, seven mile, seven stop line, and mm -hmm. they woke up one morning and said, why are we doing this? And they just ran a cable around, uh, 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 they did it in uh, the mid-90s, I believe, and it caught uh, late 90s and it cost them at that time seven million dollars to do it and they sold all their buses and ran and said we're going to run this for a lot less expensive but education, education is the key but yeah. also think, think about, about this it. too like what we were talking about earlier some of the last hurdles to bring it out of the tropics and make it a real consideration for north america uh climate control uh some more speed and predictability and as well as the manufacturers uh um starting to pay attention to cities more. I think that's another reason we're seeing a critical mass of people starting to consider it. Ed, ed, education's a big one. I used to ask this question, why don't we have a skate park in Austin? I was asking that in 1999. It took seven years before we had one. They, they were a lot of them. That was education again. Uh, and then had, we had a constituent email about uh, the SkyTran concept. Have y'all seen that? Yeah, and you know, it's a close cousin. Uh, 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 it's kind of more of a cousin of buses, but yeah, there's a Roosevelt Island tram and there's one in Portland as well. It's a similar but different technology. Uh, we didn't include it in our vision, but what it is is a very large car. Some of these can carry 200 passengers at once. It's strung across three support cables with a drive cable. Typically, these are used to span things uh, like, uh, you know, the Long Island uh, Sound or uh, the Columbia River Gorge, and to carry people point to point, almost like a ferry. Uh, and so there are buses up in the air. And for specific needs, when you need a ferry type situation, we, we see them. Um, they weren't part of our vision because we were really focusing on this uh, higher speed and these attributes um, that we thought matched the culture, the no waiting, the predictability, and the personal space, because we thought that in the southern and the western United States, if you could get those attributes, you could start getting people to move towards mass transit easier because they don't have to change their cultural underpinnings to adopt it. It behaves a lot like the things they get out of their automobiles. They don't have to change their daily routine, essentially. Does that answer your question? It does. I don't have a question as much as I have a just a comment. Uh, I love the big idea. I really, really do. Um, you know, and I'll admit that uh, I've been putting up with about three or four days of jamming and ribbing from the people at work, you know, about this conversation about gondolas, you know, what's that going to be about? 
And I think that's part of the challenge, you know. I think uh, I, I, I love what you repeatedly say about driving adoption to make it part of the culture, you know. I love that thinking because I think the big challenge of the big idea are the people that sit behind dyes like this, you know. I mean, they would sit here in these chairs and kind of have to conceptualize what, you, what you're talking about. And I think all of us are bounded by what we have come to know up until now. So when we hear the, 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 the new idea, the big idea, you know, you can come around and kind of begin to understand this a lot better than what uh, you did before. And I'll admit that up until about 11 minutes after five, I was kind of wondering, you know, <laughs> where, where, where the sales point was going to be. But I, I think it's, it's an idea with a lot of promise. I mean, the more you think about it, the share it as you say, the more we educate ourselves about it, I think the more you can understand it and, and kind of realize that this is something that's very workable. Uh, the comment, the question that Council Member Clifford asked about the fixed route, you know, from Round Rock or Georgetown to Austin, I, I, I would urge you not to give up on that idea because I think, uh, you know, that is probably the greatest need for people. I love going into Austin, but I don't like the drive idea, you know. I mean, I love going out ACL and kind of eat at the restaurants, but good Lord, I mean, you know, just driving in is such a hassle. Yeah. And I think uh, I'm one of those people that I, I would recognize that sometimes it might take an hour, so maybe 45 minutes an hour isn't that much of an inconvenience for people like me. So I, I think it's an idea that, um, that will resonate with people at some point in time, but I think um, I, I, I encourage you to have some kind of a campaign or something because I, I really like what you say, drive adoption to make it part of our culture because that thinking is not part of our culture right now, you know? We're, we're still a pickup uh, driving Texan that, you know, that, that like the freedom of the, of the space inside the cab. But too many of us are single drivers uh, taking up a lot of room on the highway. Yeah. So I, I just love the big idea, guys. I really do. Thank you. Thank you. John, we do intend to continue make it visible. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're up to the challenge on education, uh, you get in touch with Campo and see if they'll let you do a presentation at a Campo meeting. I, I can put that. you in touch on who to call. Okay. We'll take you up on that. Yeah. We're happy to show up with pirate flags and wave this banner. So. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? I just have one last yes. comment. Um, I, I think that the thing that's most appealing to me, other than it just being really cool, um, is that the footprint is so small, mm -hmm. you know, as far as, you know, your stations and your, in, in, in where the, uh, you know, rail, it just sucks up so much land and so much of, as you said, that, that you know, that land that you're going to have to buy to put it in. And this, the footprint on this is so much smaller, and that's what I, I really like about it. Uh, we like that as well. As, uh, we had the exact same reaction when we first started looking at this. When Jared mentioned that to me in his rant that morning, I laughed because I thought it was the most absurd, ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But then as a team, we actually went out and just looked at mass transit in general. And then we came back to this because once we actually started tearing through the data on it, it just seemed to make so much sense. And a lot of it's from what you just mentioned, um, just given how lightweight and modular it is. And then some of just the eco uh, uh, environmental impact on it is so, so low. It's like you can actually use... Um, green belts as right of ways and not even disrupt them. In the so. spirit of how the mayor opened it, it creates new options when you start thinking, hey, there could be one more piece to this transit puzzle. puzzle yeah. one, of our, one of our citizens, and he's already gone, so I won't mention his name, uh, brought up maybe selling advertising on it to help you know, offset some of the cost of it as well. So. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's nothing like sitting on a ski lift and looking at a new set of gloves advertised <laughs> in front of you the whole way. Not to mention all the business owners underneath that are going to sell billboard space on their roofs that you won't well, see horizontally from the roads. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, yeah. one, one of the things I, I really like about the concept and the way you've done this is that you started with what are the barriers to, to existing mass transit options? What's keeping people from using them? And then you you attacked it in that fashion. It's the scheduling. It's the scheduling. It's the space. It's all those you know all those things. Um, but you started with that premise of you know what's keeping people from using that. And then you and then you went into the premise and what's keeping what's keeping us from ad adopting it. And it's primarily cost. Mm -hmm. That the, the cost of transit is just astronomical. And when you when you look at the the, the the benefits versus the cost. Sometimes it, it becomes very difficult to to uh, convince the, the the citizens that that actually is a good investment of their 
of their dollars. And so, but you're starting with the barriers to it and then trying to, trying to match this to, as, as Carlos said, the, the pickup driving guys like me, who like my freedom, um, and, and make that fit to what I like as opposed to make me trying to fit um, somebody else's schedule. And so I think, again, the, when, when we heard this for the first time, it was really the, con it's the concept that we wanted to present, not specific that it's going to go down this street in Round Rock or anything like that. It's just the concept to let people know there, there possibly are other alternatives out there in this whole debate that we're having in a region about other forms of transportation. I know uh, Bob Bennett's back here from the RMA, um, and, and they've got some significant challenges um, for transportation that we're trying to deal with. I was in a meeting at TxDOT yesterday, and we're talking about um, um, trying to figure out how to modify 35, and we're talking billions and billions and billions of dollars. We're not talking a couple hundred million. We're talking about many with bees. Mm -hmm. And so what are the other alternatives out there for um, dealing with transportation issues? So I, I really appreciate you guys taking the time and you've done a tremendous amount of work and made it in a, a nice fun fashion for us all to look at, but we appreciate you doing this. And I'm guessing just if any, y'all can hang around if somebody wants to visit with you afterwards. So sure. that, Okay. Absolutely. Recognizing that they do have some proprietary information they may not be able to share. <laughs> but if there's anybody has any questions for uh, Michael or Jared, they'll, they'll probably be here for a while. Yeah. So. And thank you all for the invite and the opportunity to come up here tonight. Okay. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>